Um, to those of you who are joining us on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. We hope you find this webinar useful as well. All right, so calculate the basics. So the first thing, and I'm just gonna run through very briefly the functions on your calculator. So you've got the on button, kind of important. Uh, then the second function button is used to activate all of your orange functions. Your alpha key is used to activate your memory keys and your statistics functions. Um, then you've got mode, which is on the right-hand side. And that just allows you to change between the four different modes that we have on this calculator. Underneath mode is something called BS. It means backspace, not what your kids write in the test and they don't know what the answer is. And then of course, change will change the answer um, of your calculation. So from a fraction, uh, from a mixed fraction to an improper and then to decimal. And then of course your equals button is the answer to all piece. No, I'm just kidding, it gives you the answer. If it was the answer to world peace, we would have been sorted long. <laughs> All right, so modes, uh, you've got normal, which does things in like fractions, integers, probability, trig, uh, all of your basics. I'll show you a shortcut for your class next as well, which is really handy. And then, of course, stat, and that I'll show you all of the statistics very quickly. It's so, so easy. Then, of course, we have table. Um, and that is where you can plug in a function. What I want to show you using this table today is also how to apply it to factorizing, as well as applying it to um, finance and teaching finance. And we'll actually do a present value annuity using the table mode today, which is really cool. Um, and then of course you have drill. Now we're going to send this calculator to you um, to, in thanks for attending this workshop. So you'll be able to play on drill but basically drill just allows you to practice your mental maths on the calculator. I'm assuming that I am mostly talking to FET maths teachers here today. So um, I haven't included the drill function, but it is particularly nice for the younger grades, grade eight and nine uh, and even primary school. If you are a primary school maths teacher, you are welcome to join next week's workshop as well. All right, so the first thing that I wanna show you is the teacher shortcut for the class mark. So let's start here. So what we're gonna do is say, for example, you have a test which is out of 70 and you want to convert your marks to something out of 100. In other words, you're converting them all to percentages. What we're gonna do is use our fraction button and we're gonna say 100 over 70. So in other words, where you're going to goes at the top, where you are coming from goes at the bottom, right arrow button times and your first student's mark is say, I think it was 40 in my example, 40. And we say equals, and we get 57 and 1 7th. And this is where the change button comes in because we can just change it into a decimal and we get 57%. Now, instead of doing this whole long thing again, your next student's mark, all you're going to do is type in their mark and press equals. And you'll see you get 78 and 4 sevenths basically 79% if you round off correctly. Okay, so that's how it works. And you can do your entire classes like that. So you just say mark equals, uh, mark equals, mark equals, and so on and so forth. Okay, and it's really easy. What's really nice about this is that you can also teach it to your fellow teachers. So it works on any sharp calculator. And so it's just 100 divided by the total of your test equals times mark equals, and then you just keep saying mark equals, mark equals, mark equals until you're done. So you can use it on any sharp calculator. Sure, um, so Donelda's asked if we can share the link to the download. So let me show you how to do that. What I wanna do is just show my screen to you. And then what we're going to do Let's go here and I'm going to say, sorry, it's, um, there we go. So what we're going to do is go to maths at sharp.co.za. So if you're on your PCs, this is how you do it. Okay, cool. And uh, yes, I love Christmas. I should probably take it off. Hey, it's a little late in the year now. Um, <laughs> and then all you do is scroll to the right hand side, use your little arrow buttons. So the calculator we are using, that is the IEB calculator. If you want to play around with it, it does have functions like integral, differentiation, equation solving, and so on. It's the big brother to the one we're using now. And then this one, if you press the download now button, 
what's going to happen is it will ask you where you want to save it. You can just save it to your desktop. That's where I normally save it. I'm not going to save it now because I already have one. So you would just click save. I will just cancel that. And then when you are done, you'll see on your desktop, on your desktop here is your calculator. So what I would do, because I don't like to normally share my desktop, it's normally a mess, as you can see, is I would just share it on its own. And then what happens is it blacks out the rest of the calculator and you only see the calculator screen, which is wonderful. Okay, cool. So that's how we do the calculator. Um, and it's really a lovely, lovely way um, to teach using the simulator. And what's really nice is because it's free to download, your students can go and download it themselves, which is, I mean, on its own, really fantastic, especially when I show you the other stuff that we're going to do. I see this. Um, Robin, it is directed towards teachers because more teachers signed up. Um, and but any students who are watching will definitely benefit from all of the things that we're going through. It's a great summary for the year going forward, especially for grade 10, 11, and 12 students. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Ah, no problem, Robin. It's a pleasure, Denalda. Okay, great. So that is the class mark shortcut. Uh, everyone is good. I see we're all raising our hands, so that's fantastic. Okay, so there's a couple of new functions that we've added. Obviously, prime factorization is not really a new function, um, but I do want to show you how to do it just because it's always handy to know. So if we have 87 and we press equals, we can see second function and P fact, and that will give us our prime factors. Now, what I do want to say for this, um, I'm just going to go back here, is you have two other methods, which is the ladder method and the tree method. And when we look at it in grade eight and nine, we do this long method. So we have 32, and we have two, and two goes into 32 16 times. And then we say, sorry, 16 divided by two is a and eight divided by two is four, and two goes into four two times, and two divided by two is one. Okay, so that's the ladder. Again, the tree method is similar. So we have 32, and again, we break it down. So 32 is 16 times two, and 16 is broken down into eight times two, and eight is broken down into four times two, and is broken into two times two, and we can't go any further, so we count. So one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five. And we have two to the power of five. Now, this is great in, in, prime, um, in grade eight and nine. They need to be able to do this skill. It's, it's important because it helps them with factorizing and it explains the theory to them in a much better way. However, when they get to grade 10 and they start solving for exponential equations, there's no point in making them do the ladder and the tree method because they're going to practice doing these questions. So then they're wasting their time, and then it's nice to be able to just use the calculator function. Okay, so that's just why we've put it in. So now your highest common factor is a really nice function and something new. So say, for example, you want the highest common factor of 54 and 72. So we just say 54, and we press second function 2 and 72, and that will just give us the highest common factor or greatest common divisor, same thing. Of 54 and 72 is 18. So when we are looking at our factors, we're going to take out 18 out of 54 and 72. And then we would say 54 divided by 18 is what goes into the bracket. And 72 divided by 18 is what goes into the bracket. And of course, you can add as many numbers as you like. So I could add 84. Do you see? And now it changes it to 6. And I could add um, 100 and... 20, I hope that's good as a six, and so on. So you can see, you can add as many factors as you like to this string, and it will still be able to give you the highest common multiple. What's nice as well is that you have the lowest common multiple, uh, and that's just on the button three, so second function three and 72. And now when you are doing fractions and algebraic fractions, so here, if we were just doing normal fractions and we were looking for the lowest common denominator, which is the same thing as 
lowest common multiple, then we would find it using this method. And of course, you're not always just going to add two fractions, you could add three or four. So again, we can just keep adding fractions to that as well. And you'll see this. So it does save you a lot of time compared to when we look at the um, method of the, I always used to call it taking vegetables out the fridge. So all the matching vegetables come out and you leave the odd vegetables inside. And you know, that story. <laughs> I'm sure you all have your own stories as well. Um, I find stories for students are best with the best. So I just wanted to show you briefly, I'm not gonna do it on the calculator, but just something to note. The minus button is a function button and the negative button is a value button. So you cannot put two minuses together, but you can put a minus and a negative next to each other and that would work. Okay, so that's just an important note to make. What is cool though, is that you can actually teach your integers using the table function. Now listen, I love table function. I could spend three days just telling you fun stuff to do with table function. I'm not gonna, don't panic. <laughs> but I, will, I do wanna show you this. So what we did is we said negative one times any value. Okay, so ignore function two, leave your start and step at zero and one. And here you'll see any uh, negative, which is on the side, the negative one times any positive will give us a negative answer. And if I do it, you can see, doesn't matter what value of my positive, it will always be a negative answer. However, if I take a negative and I multiply it by a zero, I'll always get zero. If I multiply it by a negative, I'll get a positive. So a negative, same sign, times a negative, also a positive, um, same sign, so in other words, same signs multiply, gives us a positive. And we can go back and edit this and change it so it becomes positive one times x. And here I've got positive times positive is a positive. And I can prove that rule by going down the table for as long as I like. And positive times a negative, so different signs gives me a negative. So it's a nice way just to show them how the rule works, a nice exercise to play around with and see if they can figure out what rule you're trying to share with them. Um, and particularly with integers. Integers are, uh, they're always a, a stumbling block with, with students. So this is a nice way to teach them just basic rules and make sure they understand. Um, I want to just show you fractions because there's a recurring function here that is just epic. So let's go home. Home just takes us back to normal mode, which is just a handy shortcut. So let's say, for example, we have four over seven and we want to add five over nine. Okay, there's my fraction. So, sorry, let me do it slowly. So short version, four, then the fraction button, then your denominator, press your right arrow key to get out of the fraction, say plus, and uh, the long version is to first press your fraction P and then press your five button, press your down arrow key and then press nine. Either way, it works the same. So, you know, it's just whatever you are comfortable with. And here's our answer. And you can see if we change it, it gives us this long answer. Now, if you look closely, you can see one and one, two and two, and then you can see the seven and six don't match because the seven has been rounded. So now what you can do is set up your calculator to have a recurring decimal. So we're gonna press five and we're gonna press one for on. And if I press change now, you'll see that it gives me the recurring values. So those six values are repeated uh, infinitely. And if I press change again, it will just give me the nine decimal string that I had before. So that's just a nice thing to know with regards to the recurring decimal. What I did get asked before I switch back as well is can the calculator recognize a decimal number and the answer is yes it can so as long as you put it in a couple of times and um, so past the first screen you'll see it will just put it on that does not make sense at all um there you go two over nine okay always press your on button um, and if you had a repeat just repeat it a couple of times as well and you'll see that it will also give you the fraction for the recurring decimal. So you can check your answers. Cool, we all happy and good? Fantastic. Uh, so I'm busy setting up the math lit. Oh good, I see lots of waved hands. Thanks guys. Always nice to know you're still awake and I haven't made you fall asleep. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Fantastic. Okay. So um, I was looking at the maths literacy syllabus today as I'm finishing off the workshops for Friday. Um, and percentages is also such an important and key thing to know how to do. So if, for example, we want to, we had a price of 120 Rand and we want to add that to that price, the short version is just to say plus 15 and then second function and one. And that will automatically calculate that percentage for you, which is really nice as a shortcut. But of course, as a maths teacher, we want them to be able to do the steps. So we need to say first times 15 percent to work out how much that we're adding, and then say plus 120. You can see it gives you the same answer, but to make sure that they're getting the steps right is always an important thing as well. Ah, there's my recurring decimals. So the other question that we also often get asked is, can we change the way the answer is displayed? So here, when we um, have something like six divided by six divided by five, right? We get one and one fifth, and we have to change it to get to decimal. What you can do, however, is change it uh, by changing your editor. So we're going to change our right view to an approximate answer. And then when we say six divided by five, it will first give us the decimal. And then if we change it, it'll give us the fraction. So it's just switching the way that you see the answers around. Um, for the accounting teachers, this is particularly helpful. So if they ever ask you, uh, now you know how to do it. I'm just gonna switch back uh, because I like, and also I'm a maths teacher and I wanna see cert potential. Okay, cool. Um, Sorry, I don't know why I didn't switch there. There we go. So what I want to show you now is, is finding facts pairs, and we're going to lead into doing factorization on trinomials. So I want to do, we're just going to look for the facts pairs of 36. So we're going to go back to table mode, and we're going to plug in 36. Press our fraction button, uh, press RCL twice, and that just gives us basically a hyperbola. And then we are looking for the facts pairs of 36. We're going to ignore all of the functions and just press equals a whole bunch of times. Now, anything divided by zero is undefined, which is where that stripey line comes from. So if you are teaching grade eight and nine students, uh, you can just tell them this is an undefined line. And in grade 10, when we get to hyperbolas and tan graphs, they'll know that the line is undefined and it is actually an asymptote, which is what we're seeing here. Okay, now let's go and look at our facts base. Sorry. Sidebar. And so our fact pairs are 1 and 36, 2 and 18, 3 and 12, 4 and 9, 5 and 7.2. So we know 5 is not a factor because it has a decimal. Then if I look, I've got 6 and 6, so those are factors. And if I continue, I can see that I've come back around. My 7 and my 5 are switched. So I know that I've got all my fact pairs and I can now move on to my so what I want to do now with you is um, go back here and show you my next example. I'm glad you're all happy. Okay, so what, if we look here, all right, so we have uh, x squared plus 5x plus 6, and I've it got x squared minus 5x plus 6, and then x squared minus x minus 6. So the rule that I always used to teach my extra maths kids was to look at the back sign first. So if the sign at the back is a plus, I know that the signs in my brackets are exactly the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw brackets here and I'm going to say x plus and x plus. And here my sign is a plus, but my sign in my brackets is a minus. So both of these will be x and minus and x and minus. Here my sign at the back is a minus, so my signs will be different. So I'm not going to fill them in just yet. All right, so let's go back up to our top one, this one here. And um, we're going to go look for factor pairs of six. And because it's a plus, that add up to five. Okay, so uh, on my calculator, just close that. On my calculator, I have six that I'm looking for factor pairs of. Press the fraction button make an x. Okay, and I'm doing a very simple example here just to illustrate the point, but it works with any value as your factor pair, as you saw with the 36. 
okay, or any value that you're looking for fact is up. Now we're adding the two columns together because my sign is a plus at the back. So one plus six is seven. So that is not my middle term. So I leave it and I move on to the next set of factors. Two plus three gives me five. So yes, those are my fact pairs. I can go back here. Oh dear, it's disappeared. Um, and I can say I've got x plus two and x plus three. And it works exactly the same here because now both my signs, I'm adding them together to get five, but I just switch my signs. So it's x minus two and x minus three. Now for the last one where we have different signs, what we're gonna do with the calculator is we're just gonna call one column positive and one column negative, okay? So I'm gonna have plus one minus six, which gives me minus five. Okay, so that's not my middle term. So I move on to the next one. I'm terrible, I used the same example <laughs> three times. So plus two minus three gives me minus one. So in my brackets, I've got plus two and minus three. So if we go back here and fill it in, going to be x plus 2 and x minus 3. Do you see? And that's it for factorizing things where the a is a 1. Okay, and it's as simple as that. So looking for your fact pairs on the table, remembering one column is a plus and one is a minus if your minus sign at the back is, uh, if you have a minus sign at the back, or adding your two columns together if your, if your sign at the back is a plus. That's basically the rule. Um, so it really does help. I find it a much quicker and and when I explain it to students, they just absolutely love it. So hopefully you think it's wonderful too. Okay, cool. So that's moving on from from factorizing with with the a as a one. Now you can do a method called the airplane method, which I really like because it's got a story. Um, but I found some teachers don't really like it, so I'm not going to do it here. But if you do go look it up, it is in some of our newsletters over the past and in some of the other workshops that we've done. So you can just have a look through those notes. If you want me to specifically send you a link to that, just send me an email. Um, or comments if you're watching on YouTube, and I'll send you the link to the um, the airplane method. It's a really nice method. It does. Uh, it makes sense to me. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. What I want to show you now is the quadratic formula. Okay, so we're going to go back to our regular mode. So, for example, we have um, three x squared minus fifty one x plus seventeen. And we need to put this into the quadratic formula because as a DBE syllabus school, you cannot actually get a calculator that has an equation solver. It's not allowed. So we're going to do it this way. So we're going to save three into our a value. Then we're going to save negative 51 into our b value. And we're going to save 17 into our c value. Okay. Once we've done that, it's a matter of typing the formula into the calculator. So we can have negative b plus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay, so we've literally typed in the formula like it's written in the textbook without substituting in the values because the calculator is going to do that for you. And I'll show you why in a second. So there's our 1x value. For our second x value, what we can do is we can do this, which takes a long time. Or what we can do is press the left button, press second function left, and that takes you right to the front of the question. And then just go back a little bit, use our backspace button, substitute the plus or minus, and there's our x value, our second x value. Okay. So let's say that's wonderful for one question. But what if you have 10 questions? So let's say your next a value is negative 3. Uh, so we store that into a. And our next b value is 12. And we store that into b. And our next c value is 19. And we store that into c. Oh, it just works. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go up and look at our formula. Like we'll start with the plus 1 first. And we'll say equals. And there we go. So that's it. And then if we go back up, and we look for our negative formula, there it is, and we'll just change it, 
and there's our second x. So now we've got our two x's um, and that's it. It's really easy. It's very nice um, to use. Uh, yes, so Leah, it does actually give you a simplified third and then you can convert it back into um, decimal as well. So it will always give you, as long as you've got your editor in the exact mode, in right view exact, it will give it to you exactly as um, the uh, simplified third notation. And then if you press change, it will give you the decimal. However, if it is in the other mode, so it's in the approximate mode, then it will only give you the decimal answer and it won't go back to the uh, third note. So just be aware of that and make sure the kids have the right setting on their calculator, particularly for math as well. Thanks, Bismarck. I'm glad you find it interesting. Yay. Okay, cool. So that's the quadratic formula. Are we all happy? Are we feeling good and alive? I'm seeing lovely comments. I'm, I'm sure you haven't been. Yay for hello, raised hands. Awesome. Thanks. So the next thing that I want to show you and um, that makes teaching a lot of fun is exponents. Um, and so there's another nice way. I mean, we, we do. Uh, I don't know if you ever do it this way. I like to prove myself or prove the, the results to the students. I see this on the chat. Ah, thanks. Avedrin. Avedrin? I'm sorry. Yeah, Antoinette, I'm so glad you're learning today. Awesome. Okay, so let's say, for example, we're teaching them the exponent multiplication rule. In other words, when we have same bases, uh, we add our exponents together, right? So what we can say is times two, and I'm just going to use to power four because that's an example. So you can follow it in the notes as well. And say equals, and we get 120. Now I want to do all the different ways we can prove this to the students because I think it's important for them to see all the differences. So the first way that I'm going to do is I'm going to say two to the power of three, um, sorry, plus four, just like that. So it's the same. And equals and I get the same answer and what I can do here is I'm just going to press equals so that was that and I'm going to say second function p fact and it gives me two to the power of seven and if I go to the previous one with the plus four we can see three plus four is seven so if I press equals here and I say second function p fact I can see that as well oh I see lots of comments jumping in here um Evan, thank you, Evan. <laughs> Sorry, your long version is on here. Um, yay, Shabira. I'm glad you think so, including equal. That's I appreciate that you think I'm being very thorough. Um, Zarimbi, um, can I come back to you? I will send you the notes because I think it will be much easier for you to follow on the calculator with the notes um, on the quadratic formula. Uh, it does take a bit of time. So oh, let me actually just go back to that very briefly, quickly. So Zerumbi is asking how I, I typed in the formula. What you do is you store your values. And before I continue, if you want to check what values are in your memory keys, you can just press alpha and nine, and it will show you everything that is saved. So in other words, in A, I've got negative three, B, I've got 12, and C, I've got 19. It's a nice way to check that you've got the right values saved in the right place. Now, if we wanted to type any sort of substitution expression in with our letters, okay, we use the alpha key to call the letter, and then we just uh, do our regular maths to it, and you'll see if we just press this. So if I did that long formula, I can just say negative alpha b plus and square root and so on and so forth. I'm not going to do the whole thing now. Um, oops, I'm sorry. That is not what I mean to do. You know what I mean. Sorry, I'm, I'm going a little nuts over here. Um, Motale Pula, I'm sorry, that's just dreadful. Can you please share the link or notes for quadratic equation when factorizing? Yes, I will send all of these notes to you on Monday once all of the workshops are finished, and then I will send you the notes as well as the links to YouTube as well. Okay, so you'll have everything you need in order to follow along with you, with um, the workshop that we're doing today. Okay, so we can use the same rule uh, to teach. Simba Rashi, your W506 is the old one, I assume, it's not the P, and that's the difference. Uh, so you'll get one now today because you're all getting calculators today for attending, which does have P factors, so ta-da! 
Okay, <laughs> great. So the certs you can teach in exactly the same way. Uh, I'm not going to do it here because it is exactly the same sort of logic as the exponent, but it is here to make a note of and, and help you along when teaching sets. All right, there was a special request here for, for logs. Um, so what we can do, I just want to show you how to do the logs. Everybody will get the notes. Okay, just everyone. So here you have two logs. So you have the log with the base 10. And so you don't need to actually type in the base, you can just press log and whatever thing, and it will give you your answer. If you have a log with a base that is not 10, then you need to press second function on your pi button. You'll see an orange that says log ax. And then you type in your base first, press your right arrow key, type in your value, let's call it 16 just for a fun change, and equals, and you'll get your answer. Okay, so that's just the difference between the two. Okay, um, so moving on to trigonometry, right? So there's a very nice shortcut that you can use in normal mode. And these are your, called your D1, D2, D3 keys, okay? And they're very handy. So if, for example, uh, in grade 10, we start teaching trigonometry and we teach them about the ratios and the angles and the, you know, you have tan theta is equal to X over Y, Y over X. You are excellent or, yeah, Y of X, okay? So that's those ones here. So these ones give you your ratio. And if you take the inverse of sine, these ones give you your angle, right? I said a half. Now what we can do to help the students remember this is to actually save your statistics inverses, in other words, the ones that give you the angle, into your D keys. And you remember D for degrees, and there you go. And then it just saves them a bit of time with typing. The nice thing here is they can save over these D keys. So if they like another function, if you're doing probability and you're using the dice function a lot, you can save the dice function into your D key as well. So it's very handy. It works um, both ways. If you reset the calculator, you'll lose whatever you've saved in here. So it's not a permanent storage thing. Okay, you can save over it or delete it or whatever makes you happy. Okay. Um, I see a question here. Yay, I'm glad you like the trig function of it. Okay, so what I want to show you now, and I'm not sure if I included in the notes, so I just want to make sure that I have, is say, for example, you have a p-coordinate on your Cartesian plane. So the x value is 5 and your y value is 12. Okay. So you type in your x value first, press this x comma y button, and press 12. And then we're going to say second function and eight. And you'll see here, it gives you your hypotenuse, which is R is theta. Uh, sorry, R, which is your hypotenuse, is 30. And theta, which is the angle the hypotenuse makes with your x axis, which is 67,38 degrees. Now, what's also nice is these get saved into your x and your y indices. So you can use them in other calculations as well if you want. Alrighty, let's see where else we are going. Ah, see, it is in the notes. Ha ha, ta -da. Um, The next thing I want to talk to you is, is about explaining the cost diagram. So I'm not going to type it all into the calculator because you've seen how the um, table mode works. And I don't want to take up your valuable time in this afternoon, especially since it is 20 to 4 already. So I'm just going to briefly walk through this with you. Okay, so how do we get the cost diagram? Where does it come from? Well, what happens if we drew a sine graph and we looked at the values between negative 180 and negative 90? And you'll see here that yeah. you'll see all of those values are negative. And between negative 90 and zero, they're all negative. And between zero and 90, they're all positive. And between 90 and 180, they're all positive, and so on and so forth. So what we can do is do this table with all three cos 10 and look at the pattern. And you'll see here between zero and 90, sine, cos, and tan will all be positive. So that's an A. Uh, let me actually just fill it in here so you can see what I mean. So here they'll all be positive. So this will be A. And then if we think about the cost diagram, so only sine will be positive here, and these two will be negative, and only 
tan will be positive here. And uh, sorry, that's cons. Uh, so tan will be positive and sine will be, uh, cos will be negative and sine will be negative. So that's um, tan and, and that's sine. And then between 270 and 360, cos will be positive and tan will be negative and that will be here. And if you look here, here as well, if you go this way, cost diagram. So that's where the cost diagram comes from. And it's a really nice exercise because your table is unlimited. I mean, you can really go force on this if you wanted to. Um, it's really up to you uh, how far you go with this exercise, but it is such a nice way for your students to see um, what, how, where the cost diagram comes from and why we use those rules that we use when we are looking at um, your solving equations and finding a specific value and a general solution as well. Because all of that comes from the fact that your graphs just repeat themselves over and over again. And because your table mode is unlimited and you can see the values repeat. Um, if I look here, here's zero comma zero seven, here's positive, here's negative, here's negative, here's positive, you see. So they do repeat. Um, and that's where all of those values come from and why we use the rules that we use when we do them. Okay. Now we're going moving on to the special request stuff. So probability, you have a really nice function um, called random. And it's so nice for introducing the concept of probability uh, to your students. So if you look at random, random does random decimals between zero and one to three decimal places. For grade eight and nine math teachers, math lit guys, practicing rounding off, fantastic. Um, the R dice function does random numbers between one and six. Your coin does random numbers between zero and one. So it's like heads and tails, except zeros and ones. So when you do the exercise, just allocate one is a heads and zero is a tail or whatever makes you happy. Now the three is a random integer. And what's really nice about random integer is you can select what you want random numbers between. So if, for example, I wanted to generate random lottery numbers, okay, then I could say 1 and 52. And if I press equals, it will just randomly generate lottery numbers. So back in the day, you know, pre-COVID, what we would do with students is ask them to write their lottery numbers down on a piece of paper. Now, if you're doing Zoom lessons with a group of students, you can get them to write it in the chat, which is what we did yesterday morning. Um, so you ask them to write down their six lottery numbers into the chat. What's really nice about this is they really can't cheat because they can't undo what they've written. Um, and everyone else can see what they've written as well. And then of course, you just generate the random numbers on the calculator for them and we see if anyone actually won the lottery. So far, I haven't won either. So, but if you guys generate random lottery numbers and you win using my method, I would like about the chat. Okay, cool. <laughs> What I want to show you now is the, uh, here's the steps for playing the lottery. Here's permutations and combinations. And this is particularly important for grade 12 and your fundamental counting high school. And we often don't get to it in the syllabus because we run out of time, which I think we're not doing in AP this year anyway. But as an extra, it's always nice to know um, what the difference is. So a combination is the order doesn't matter. In other words, you're chucking all of the elements that you've selected into a bag and shaking them around. It makes no difference. Whereas with permutations, the order does matter. And when you check on the calculator, the difference between the two, you will have far less, a smaller combination than your permutation if you're using the same value. So your permutation will be much larger because your order does matter. So if I had these three marbles, you can see just from that, that I've got three different options. Whereas here, I've just got one option. Okay, so that's just permutations and combinations. I'm just gonna skip through because they're quite simple. I don't wanna get to the calculus as well. Now, yesterday I was doing this calculus example with the maths teachers. Oh, I see there's a question here, let me just pause. Klantla, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, if you're doing O-levels, what you should definitely do is um, use the W506 because you're allowed to do that. And then you have all sorts of extra features um, which make it even better. Uh, <laughs> all right, so back to here. So what we're doing, um, when I was explaining this section yesterday, 
uh, showed them how you could use your statistics linear regression to actually find the gradient of your uh, between two points. But what I realized yesterday when I was doing this is that it takes a really long time to get to the answer. I mean, it seems like a great idea at the time when you're plugging it all in and you've got done three slides and it's wonderful. And you can see, here's your gradient. I mean, here's your y-intercept. Here's your gradient, which is three. And here's your correlation coefficient, which we'll get to just now when we're doing stats. But the point of the exercise is that you only want the three. Um, and so it, it just was so much work with so little reward. So I'm um, actually just, please just ignore that. It's not worth your time. Um, and what we're gonna do is just use the traditional route, which is know your formula, plug your values into the formula, and then press equals. The only time I would recommend using the stats route is if you have students who mix up the Ys and the Xs. So they'll match an, a Y2 with an X1 and it's a chronic problem. Because on this other option here, where we do the stats, you can see that they have to match the coordinates together. So they can't mix it up. And when they're typing it in, they have to put the coordinate in as a coordinate. So that's, that's the only time I would say, yes, use that statistics method instead of using this method. Okay. Now, what I want to show you, <clears throat> and which I found super fun and awesome, is we're going to go back to our table mode. And we're going to plug in our um, calculus graph. So I'm just going to make, I'm hoping I can remember my example, but you think after a couple of times, I'll be okay. 34x minus 48. Okay, so there's a graph. I know it works. Um, I took it from one of the questions in the worksheets that we have, so I know it works. Um, and I'm going to ignore function two for now, but I do want to come back to it in a few. And here's my start and my step. Okay, so if we look, and, and we can see straight away at one, there's a y-intercept, sorry, an x-intercept. So your y is zero and x is equal to one. And if we were looking for the factor pairs, we'd say x minus one is a factor pair because we just bring the one across the equal sign. And if we go down the table <clears throat> and we look, We'll see, our, these values are just growing astronomically. So we're not gonna find another zero in this direction. So let's just go and look up above it. So there's a negative 70, and you can see it's going back up again. There's your zero. So at an X is equal to negative six, I have zero. In other words, my factor is X plus six. And if I keep looking some more, here's my other one. So at negative eight, I have zero, which means X plus eight is another factor. So I found all my calculus graph factors and I can now move on to the next part. Let's do a check. Um, so, Sulia, um, you've asked, is there a limit? No, there is no limit to the table. And I'll be I'll be ridiculous now and I'll just keep pressing And you can go for as long as you like, you won't find out the space, but the table is unlimited. And it's really nice when you are teaching concepts like this one. Look at this, this is just crazy. And, uh, or teaching concepts where you do multiples. So for example, oh dear, I'm digressing here. But if, for example, I wanted the multiples of nine, what I could do, here you go, is now I have all the multiples of nine. So I can say to the students, give me the multiple of nine times 30. And all I have to do is scroll through the table and you can see there's your pattern as well. So for teaching patterns, it's 270. So it's really nice and it, it is great, isn't it? Um, it's a really nice function for students and for teaching math, it just makes things so much more exciting and fun. Okay, let me go back here uh, because I wanna show you something else here now. Okay, so that's that one, right? Then what I've done, and I actually need to go and look at that equation. So just give me a sec to go across. Is I've actually done the um, different derivative of this calculus graph. Okay, and that's this one here. I've just calculated using it the quick short rules um, because if I did it by first principles, <laughs> my brain might explode. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say three x squared, and we're putting this into function two. Um, plus 26x plus 
Okay, so that's our derivative. And you can see our gradient is positive um, most of the time, which should be a parabola. Okay, now if we look and we compare, here's our, uh, so our answer to column is actually the gradient at that point, okay, which is really nice. Uh, and you can see as we go up the X value chain that our gradient is just getting steeper and steeper. I mean, that's 778 over one. So that's a huge um, step up. And then if we go back up, so let's look at where we had our intercept. So there's our first one. And here we can see the change between positive gradient and a negative gradient, which means that there's a hump at that point in the graph. Okay. And in other words, we're looking here at a, um, sorry, I've lost the word for it. You know what I mean. Um, sorry. It's really gone. <laughs> I should have drunk all my coffee before I started this webinar. Um, it's a critical point. That's the word. Okay, and then if you continue, and you can see again, your gradient is starting to become more and more uh, and less negative. And so here again, it switches between seven and eight. So there is your other hand. Now, if we just look at the data from our table, and I'll go back to our screen here because I'm going to draw it for you. What we're actually seeing is the effect of this graph. So we know the graph is a positive graph, which means it does this shape, right? But what it's actually telling us is that this is going down like that, and that is going up like that. And you can see that from the gradient. So it's really actually this little piece that we look at, but there's so much more to the graph than just that little section. I see lots of questions. Uh, thank you, turning points and stationary points. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Tired, I'm glad to say. Thanks, Evan. I appreciate that. Cool. So let's clear all of these drawings. Here. So it's a really nice way um, to see what's going on with the, with the gradients as well. Awesome. So there's all of those steps. What I did is I took an example out of Kevin Smith's handbook and study that. Let's see, there's another question. Ah, thank you, Rodney. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, what I did is I took a, uh, an example question out of Kevin Smith's handbook and study guide for grade 12. Um, I think his textbooks are just wonderful, but I'm biased. So that's my only plug for today, okay? Apart from obviously sharp. Uh, <laughs> so the question says the volume of water in a rainwater collection tank t minutes, important, after it starts to empty is given by the equation. And here's your volume equation, where volume is measured in liters. Okay. I see there's a question, let me just check. So Barney says, is the calculator able to solve for n in a future value or present value annuity without first making n the subject of the formula? So Barney, can we come back to that because we are gonna talk about future present values in a few. Shredo, and yes, we can do that. Um, okay, so the first question is determine the initial volume of the water in the tank. So we want to know when initial means that time is zero. So we just substitute zero into our equation. You can type it into the calculator, but five minus zero is still five, and five squared is 25, and 25 times four is 100. So if you're not confident in your little mental maths calculation, yes, absolutely do it on the calculator, especially in exams when you want to check. But knowing your mental maths will help you do everything so much faster. So the second question is, at what rate is the water in the tank changing after 180 seconds? So the first hint to answering this question is it's a rate question, which means that we need to find the derivative. Okay, and then after we found the derivative, we need to substitute in the time. Now here it's asking in 180 seconds, but the formula is given to us in minutes. And you'll see why that's important in a few. Okay, so first of all, we, sorry, I need to change this. We need to multiply out our expression, our squared, and that gives us a final answer of 100 minus 40t plus and then we just differentiate that. So 100 differentiates is zero because it has no variable. Uh, T becomes one, so it's just negative 40 times one is negative 40. T squared becomes two T times four is eight T. So our derivative is negative 40 plus eight T. Now we have the derivative and we have to substitute in 180 seconds. And that's exactly precisely what I did when I was preparing for this workshop. And I looked at the answer and I thought, 
my goodness, what a strange answer. And then I realized that the question asked for it in minutes. So be aware that you need to be able to convert your seconds into minutes. And that's just 180 divided by 60, which is something we should know at grade 12 level, we hope. Um, and, and then just substitute it into the formula. So what's happening is at three minutes, the tank is losing 16 liters. That negative means losing water. It's emptying, it's not gaining water. Um, at 16 liters per. The last one is how long will it take for the tank to empty? So we're just looking for when is the volume of the tank zero? And we just substitute zero in there and solve for T. And the answer is five. And if you plug this into your table mode, you would see that five is zero. And that's where it comes from. But again, this is unnecessary if your basic algebra is strong. So that's just the difference. Uh, yes, sorry, did I type that in wrong, Avun? Um, yes, so I see I should go and fix that. Before I send you the notes, I will make sure that it's um, B prime three and not C. I told you I made that obviously, and I didn't fix it either. So sorry. Okay, so let's walk through finance. Now, if you've attended one of our workshops before, you'll often see me showing this. Um, positive simple interest and then we do compound interest. And I'm just going to skip through these because I actually want to get to the decay section and then on to the um, present value annuity and that question for um, sorry the question for to buy me. Okay so Right, so if we wanted to do simple decay, I'm just going to use a thousand rand as my initial value. And I'm going to say one minus instead of plus because it's decaying, it's dropping, it's losing value. And we'll just call it 5%, so over 100, and times x, and close brackets, and equals. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make my function to a compound decay. Uh, equation of the same values, um, but instead it will just be a compound expression. So we're going to put an x into the uh, n value instead of putting in a direct n value so that you can see how it changes over time. Um, so here we have over the first year, they both lose exactly the same amount. But if you look at just the simple interest as I'm scrolling down, you can see that the value keeps changing the same amount, keeps losing 50 bucks every year. Whereas if we look at our decay, it's losing less money every year. Okay, and that's the difference between simple and compound. And you can show your learners if you're teaching simple and compound interest. It's exactly the same except you just change the positive and negative. Now from here, I just want to go back because I want to look at my formula. We can lead into uh, an annuity. Okay, and this is what um, Sabani Tabani was asking us just now, and which I'll get to in a few, but I want to do this first, and then we'll do Tabani's version. Okay. So, um, on the calculator, I'm sorry, I just need to move this so that I can move that. There we go. Okay. So, we're going to go back here, and we're just going to type in a present value, and instead of um, a value for my payment, I'm just going to actually put an X value. Okay. And then we're going to type in the rest of the formula. So it's one minus open brackets, one plus. And we're going to use a 10% interest rate. So 10 over 100. And it's going to be compounded monthly. Okay. And then to the power of five years, compounded monthly. Okay. Or monthly repayments, close that bracket, all over 10%. Compounded monthly. Okay, so there we go. That's your present value annuity. Um, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I don't want to do function two. It's just going to confuse the whole issue. Right, so what have I done here? I've said if I'm willing to pay one rand a month, I can borrow 47 rand over five years. Okay, if I borrow two rand, I can pay back nine, I can borrow 94 rand. If I borrow three, if I can pay back three rand, oh my goodness, this is ridiculous. So what we're going to do is we're just going to change the step to say 100. 
um, just because it gives us a nice view. So if I could afford to pay back 100 Rand over five years at 10% compound interest, compound uh, money, I could borrow 4,700 Rand. And so what's really nice is your students can go and look, okay, if I have a budget of 1,500 Rand, I can borrow 70,000 and if I had a budget of 2,000 Rand, I could borrow 94,000 Rand. So this is where buying a car and budgeting for a car becomes a really nice exercise. You could also do this with your present value in your estate. So you could say, okay, um, I mean, sorry, your future value in your estate, and you could see how much money you would save over how many years, um, five years or 10 years, whatever you plug in, and look at that value as well. Okay, now we, Tabani was asking whether we could do for N, and you can. So let's, for example, say that our monthly repayment is 500 Rand. I'm just going to use the rest as the same sum. One plus my interest rate is 10%. I should have just done 500 now. Terrible, terrible. Anyway, I'm sorry, guys. And close that to the power of. So now, instead of an N, we're going to put in N, X, and multiply it by 12 to give you your years, and close brackets, and 10 over 100 times 12. Okay, so just note here that that N is years and not months. Just be aware of that, okay. And um, we'll change our step back to one so we can look at our years. So, um, in one year, that's how much you've paid back. In two years, you've paid that much back at 500 Rand a month. In three years, that's how much you, um, how much you can borrow, uh, four years and so on and so forth. So it just depends on what type of question you're looking for. And you can see, okay, you can solve for it. Now, the other thing is if I didn't put the, um, times 12, what it would become then is your monthly. Do you see the difference? So now this is my monthly change and I can look for the precise value of the p-value that I'm looking for and find it and solve for in that way. Thanks, Evan. I'm so glad you're happy and like my ideas for <laughs> annuities. That's wonderful. So Tabani, are you happy that answers your question? Um, you know, Sweetos. Okay, let's move on to statistics. Um, I just want to do it very quickly with you. I mean, stats is really wonderfully easy and quick. So, um, so mode and then one for stat. Let's just do a basic example first. So zero four single data. It doesn't mean a standard deviation. It just means single data. In other words, I have one set of data, a class marks, various maths marks, whatever, um, number of cars per hour. All of that sort of stuff. Okay, so we'll just type in some values. I am just making them up here as we go along. Let's do one more. Okay, so there's my values. If I press change, it takes me to my stats calculation screen. If I press change again, I can go back through my data. Now, see, I've made a mistake. I shouldn't have typed in 14. I should have typed in 41. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the incorrect value and type over it and press equals. And you'll see the 14 is now replaced by 41. So it's really easy to go back and edit and change your dot. Okay. When you are done, here's the hard part. Are you ready? You're going to press the alpha key, number eight, and zero. Well, that's it. That's all there is to stats. Well, at least the stats up until grade 11. And obviously your interpretation, which is the important part. So there's nine, your standard DV, your X is your average, which is 54,88 or 54.89. We don't use the standard deviation. We use the Sigma X because of the formula that it uses as well. And then of course, minimum quartile one, maximum, uh, sorry, median quartile three and maximum. And that's it. Very, very easy. Um, the step for the stats, event, I assume. Okay, Sabani, I'm going to come back to you now, okay? 
Uh, okay, so for stats, very simple. From your table, you're just going to press change. You're going to say alpha, and you'll see in little blue on the eight, it says stats. So we use press eight, and then we just choose zero for statistics value. And there we go. Um, so Sabani is going back to the present value question, and he's saying if you are given the present value interest rates and payment amounts, and then you need to find out how long it will take. So if I recall, um, give me a sec here. I want to just go back to that present value. Um, sorry. Just there. So if we look at the present value formula, so say for example, our present value is um, 100,000, right? Uh, 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 one, two, three, okay, sorry, more that, okay. Is equal to and the rest of our formula. Okay, and say our X is 500, okay? And then we'll leave the rest as is with our N that we are looking for, times 12, and the interest rates over there. Okay, so what we know is if I said 100,000 minus 500, it would give me zero, right? So what we can do on the calculator is we can just go and say, I'm going to go back to my table mode, read table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I can borrow 100,000. Okay, that's the right money, minus, and now I'm going to type in that annuity formula. So my monthly repayments is 500, 500 rand. That will take you a long time to repay. Um, one minus one plus, oopsie, I need a bracket, sorry, brackets. One plus, let's call the interest rate 10% over 100, and it's compounded monthly um, to the power of. Um, negative, and now we're going to put in our n because that's sorry, I didn't put in a power there. to the power of negative n. Okay, and I'm going to leave that without the 12 so that we can find the exact number of months that it's going to take. Okay, close my brackets and then put it all over interest again. Okay, so that's everything, and now we are looking for the place where our answer is zero. That's how long it will take. So I can just scroll through my table. You can see it's gonna take a very, very long time because I chose a ridiculous amount of paper. Sorry guys, it's gonna take a long, 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 long time. Um, you know what? I'm just gonna change my X uh, to, let's just make it a more reasonable amount of 5,000 rand. Okay. Just so that it takes quicker. When you have time with the students, I, I just don't want to take up all your evening time. The teachers work hard enough as it is. They don't need me wasting their time for them. So let's just scroll through that. And here you go. So it will take 22 months uh, to repay the loan, okay, which is basically nearly two years. And if we calculate it, five times 12 is 60, um, and 22 times five, it would be. A hundred and something. So you can see that it works out according to how much we've put in plus the interest. Okay. Are you happy with that, Sabani? Does it make sense? I don't need to change anything else for you. Awesome. All right. Fantastic. So let's go back. Um, actually, I'm going to stay here. Let's go back to our linear regression on the stats mode. Sorry, we really jumped there, but it's such a great question and it is something that we need to know. Um, so awesome. Let me see. Yay, it's funny. Um, so Ramat Simele, I'm sorry, I'll probably go to this, says, should we allow grade seven and eight to use a calculator when dealing with mean and median, I mean, straight from the calculator. So um, firstly, um, a calculator is a fantastic tool, and it's really something that you can use to teach your students well with. But you cannot allow them to use it as a crutch because then they aren't using their brains, which is the whole point of maths. Maths is logical thinking and problem solving. That's the actual skill that we want them to take with them into real life. Um, and if I look at my applied maths and stats degree, the skills that I'm taking with me are not 
that I can calculate um, a standard deviation and all of that nonsense. My skill is that I can look at a problem and say, this is the solution and this is how you figure out a solution to that problem. And that's what we want from maths. So in grade seven and eight, yes, it's wonderful to be able to check our answers, but I wouldn't necessarily teach them how to use the shortcut just yet. Um, I would rather teach them at right at the end of the year that they can check the answers um, on the calculator. So I see lots of comments. Um, thanks, Nkantla. Uh, I think you're great too. Um, Robin, it's, it's slightly longer than an hour. Um, just because maths has so much more to it, but we are nearly finished. Okay. Uh, it does seem very easy with the calculator. Yes, I will send you the notes, Lauren. Thank you, Siander. Thanks, Rosh, and I'm glad you like the calculator. Yay! Okay, I promise we are nearly done. So let's get down to linear regression, and this is particularly for grade 12. So with linear regression, what you can do is you can type in all your X values or and type in all your Y values. Um, but you know, for me, I, to me, that's confusing. What I would prefer for the students to do is actually to type in the X and Y values as a coordinate pair. So if I have a coordinate of two and um, eight, for example, uh, what you'll see now is if I type it in like that, it automatically puts it across the table. Firstly, when we're doing linear regression, and this is another thing about talking about practice, if you're putting it into the table as a coordinate pair, because what we are is drawing a scatter plot, then they can see the relationship between the X and Y. Whereas if they're just shoving all the X's in and shoving all the Y's in, then they're not actually seeing the point of the graph. And they can easily skip one and then mess everything up. So I think it's much better. Personally, uh, please don't take my word as bold, but in my humble opinion, um, I do believe that that way of, of method of putting stuff into the is a much safer way to do it. So it's just seven X comma Y button over there, just like we did for Pythagoras. And I'm making up something here. And four. I see there's a chat here. Season uh, uh, yes, uh, the YouTube video will be up on Monday and um, once all of the webinars are completed for this week. Okay, cool. So those are all your values. We can press change. And again, all we're going to do is say alpha and Stats. And again, if you press zero, all of your summary stats are there, your average for X and standard deviation, your minimum, maximum, your average for Y, standard deviation, and so on and so forth. Now, if you want the linear regression, which is pretty much the whole point of linear regression, we press um, alpha, stat, and one. And you can see I didn't do very nice coordinate um, things, but in real life, again. So A, uh, your y-intercept is 4.97 if we round it off, and your gradient is 1.21. And you can see r is 0 0.97. So I still have a pretty straight line. The correlation is very strong. Um, and if I drew the graph, it would be pretty strong. Uh, OK. So that's linear regression. It's a pleasure, Susan Bailey. Awesome. I think let's go back to my presentation to make sure that I have covered everything. That's statistics. Lots of um pages all with the information that you need okay euclidean geometry a again i'm going to repeat myself for those who missed out in the beginning i don't like it that much i'll be quite honest with you uh, if you want to watch the youtube uh, video with kevin smith on the workshop that we did last year which was awesome that is the link so when i send you the pdf presentation you can click on that link and go and watch the work uh, it was done by kevin we are planning another one for this year june he's just finishing his course okay um i'm going to stop recording so to those of you who are watching on youtube thank you so much for joining us uh, we appreciate your comments and your subscriptions so please do follow us for more exciting videos